name is Jeff, and if you've never been to LifePoint before, I have the privilege of pastoring this incredible church, and so it's an honor to have you with us. I hope that today is just going to be a great day for you, because you picked a great day to be here. I don't know if you just happened to wake up this morning and say, I want to go to church, or if a friend has been inviting you, but I'm glad you're here. We're beginning a brand new series called At the Movies. And this is going to be a blast. The next four weeks, we're going to spend time looking at blockbuster hits, and we're going to be extracting spiritual truth from that. And this has become one of the most favorite series that we do. We've done this for several years now, and a lot of times I always get the question, so I want to address it on the front end. Like, why would a church talk about movies? And I would say, why wouldn't a church talk about movies? I mean, just obvious answers. We love movies, don't we? I mean, just raise your hand if you have watched a movie in the last year. Okay, that's pretty much all of us. If you haven't, you got to check them out. They're awesome. <laughs> movies are great. I think we love movies and we love story. We love the fact that no matter what's going on in our life, we can suspend reality for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours because of previews. And we get to go to the movies and we can have a bucket of popcorn. I mean, is there anybody, let's just be honest, you love popcorn. Is there anybody here, back me up if you, if you have, you go to the movies really just to get popcorn? My wife was out of town a little while ago, and so the kids were like, what are we eating tonight? I was like, I don't know, let's go to the movies. We literally went to the movies. It was like two birds, one stone. We have popcorn at the movies. And now I don't just mean popcorn. I mean, like, is there anybody that's very particular about their popcorn? Like, don't hand me a full thing of popcorn. You better layer that. You just know what I'm talking about? I'm about to educate some folks up in here. Somebody get your notes out, write this down. Layered popcorn is a gift from the Lord, okay? <laughs> layering. Now, see, layering popcorn is not healthy for you at all, but hey, you're at the movies eating popcorn. We're not here for health. So layering is where you ask them to put a little bit of popcorn and a lot of butter. A little more popcorn, a lot of butter. Because what happens when you get halfway through your popcorn? You got to get up and go back out and get more butter. So let's do it on the front end, and that's what layering is. And I like it when I get to the bottom and it's just swimming. It's swimming in. That's, I mean, it's, oh, and your stomach hurts later, but who cares? Because you just had popcorn. So I love it. So, so we love movies. You know, one of the things my family enjoys is movies. I mean, whether it's going to the movies or whether it's, you know, sitting on the couch watching a movie, we just love them. We love them. You know, biblically speaking, why would we do a series on, on movies? You know, when you look at the Bible, some of the teachers in Scripture, like Jesus, for instance, and some of the people that we see teaching throughout Scripture, they're some of the most amazing teachers because they understood how to use what was cultural to communicate the message of Christ. And so you find Jesus oftentimes using something that is culturally relevant to communicate the timeless truths of Scripture. Matter of fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, there's a guy, and his name is Paul, and he goes to a place in Greece where people are very educated, they're very spiritual, they have all kinds of philosophy, and there's poets, and there's influences of the day, and this, this preacher named Paul goes there, and he acknowledges, man, you guys are very religious, and all of a sudden, Paul starts using their own poets and philosophers to raise questions and introduce a topic so that he can tell them about Jesus. So one of the biggest reasons that we use this movie series is because I think that our world today, if there were poets and philosophers in our world today, they are the, they're the, they're the songwriters and the screenwriters of our day. You want to get your fingers on the pulse of culture today, listen to the popular music and watch the movies and you'll know what our hearts long for. I think when we see these movies that we're going to be talking about through this series and, you know, top blockbuster hits, we ought to ask ourselves, why is that such a big hit? There's something in that that connects with who we are. If you think about it, we're told that we're made in the image of God, in the image of God. God is a creator. Is it any wonder that when we create stories, we create these incredible stories of courage and sacrifice and love and loss because that's hardwired into our hearts. So during this series, we're going to have a blast. We're going to watch, uh, we're going to start off the series today with Avengers Age of Ultron. Um, raise your hand if you've seen Avengers Age of Ultron. Just want to see. Okay, so we'll, spoiler alert, we are going to talk about this movie. We are going to use some clips, so you should probably go see it pretty soon. But just in case you don't know much about it, Age of Ultron is the second release in, in Marvel's Avengers series. So it's, it's kind of the part two. There's more coming. Now, this one is a pretty big budget, $250 million production budget. That's a lot of money, big budget. 
grossed $1.4 billion worldwide, making it the number two release of 2015. Great, great movie. And honestly, this movie's got something for everybody. I don't know what kind of movies you like, but there's action. I mean, I think there's probably over half the movie is fight scenes, which is probably why us guys like it. There's more fighting than dialogue. There's suspense. There's love. There's sacrifice. I mean, it's a, it's a great movie. The cast is stellar. I mean, diversity of characters. But here's the thing about this movie is we all begin to identify with different characters. And the whole plot of this movie, without giving away too much, is this. Billionaire inventor Tony Stark sets out to create this artificial intelligence that is going to eradicate evil and crime, and it's called, it, it's called Ultron. Well, Ultron begins to think for itself and comes up with this idea that the only way to get rid of evil and crime is to eliminate the human race altogether because all of us at our core are sinful and we're broken. And so all of a sudden this good idea goes bad and the Avengers have got to work together to defeat Ultron, to save humanity. It's one of those like all or nothing where all, all of our lives are on the line kind of movie and we love that. And here's what I love about this movie. Here's what I think resonates with each of us is that these Avengers are all so different. I mean, you think about Hulk, you think about Iron Man, you think about all these different guys, they're, they're so different, but they've got to work together. They've got to work together. And so here's what I want you to write down. If there's something we take away from this movie and a spiritual theme that we're going to look at through the lens of Scripture, I want you to get a great note card, write this down, and here it is. We are better together. Would you write that down? We are better together. We are better together. Matter of fact, as you're writing it down, say it with me. We are better together. One more time. We are better together together. The Bible tells us this from cover to cover. We're better together. When God created humanity, Adam and Eve, when he created Adam, he said it's not good that he should be alone. And he created Eve because we're better together. When we start looking through scripture and you see Jesus in the gospels, Jesus didn't fly solo. He invited people into his life because we're better together. When Jesus sent his disciples out to do ministry, he sent them out in teams. Why? Because we're better together. When the early church was getting started, and you can read about it in the book of Acts, they committed to do life together. Why? Because we're better together. There's a, an African proverb I read recently that said, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Together. There's so much power when we're together. And when, there's probably no more recent just illustration or reference point of this than just a, several days ago as a nation, we stopped and we remembered 9-11. I mean, you couldn't get on social media without just seeing so many posts. And I don't know what that does for you. 14 years is a long time, but isn't it true that when you saw a post about 9-11, you instantly went back to the place that you were the moment you heard the news. I remember exactly where I was. I remember thinking, is this a movie? What is this? And then as I sat there watching my heart sank and then you began to see the way that our nation put aside all differences didn't matter what political party you stood with didn't matter you know who you voted for didn't none of that matter you you rallied together because we're better together and I found myself sitting down explaining to my youngest he said I really don't know exactly what happened and I began just telling him about the events of 9-11 and I I mean, I was fighting to get the words out. Like, I don't know anybody that directly lost their life or lost a loved one. But this is my country. And this is something I'm a part of. And I just got choked up even as I was telling him about these events. And, and so a little bit later that day, we were riding around in my car. We were up towards Market Street. And he had a, a small American flag, a little flag that he had out the window. And I heard people honking at us. Now, I don't know how you feel when you hear somebody honk, but I get a little defensive. I'm like, who are they? What, what am I doing? Like, I'm in my lane. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not violating any speed limits. And I realize they're not actually honking, like, at me because I'm doing something wrong. They're honking at him because he's waving the flag. And people would pull up, and they'd thumbs up, and they'd give him a fist bump, and they were cheering for him. And suddenly, like, this sense of pride overcame me. And I was like, you know what? There is still power, like, in our country. This is not a political message, but for just a moment. When we stand together, my goodness, there's so much synergy and I'm just reminded of how tragedy can lead to unity and how any time that we face evil, that when we come together, there's nothing we can't overcome because we're better together. We're better together. The Bible tells us that this isn't a new concept. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, the wisest man who ever lived said it this way. If you still got your device open to Ecclesiastes 4, you got a Bible, 
And by the way, if you don't own a Bible, we're going to reference a few passages today. And if you're like, man, I'd love to read that in, in a Bible, but I don't have one. Or let's just be honest. You're like, I had one, but I have no idea where it's at. Before you leave today, stop by our next steps in the lobby and our team will give you a Bible. It's free. We just want you to have it. You can read this for yourself. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, the Bible says this. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Now, this, does, this is not like any new information here. You know, two people are working on something versus one person. The two people are going to accomplish more. They have a good return. But it goes on in verse 10. It says, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. I love this imagery that we're better together, that if we're in a battle, by ourselves we'll be overtaken. Two of us, we can stand back to back. Three of us, man, we can throw down and we can hold our own. The, the question is, who avenges you? Who's got your back? You know, there's this moment in the movie right near the beginning where you see all these Avengers and they're just coming together and they're fighting together. I mean, it's slow-mo, explosions, it's everything you want in a movie and you're like, yeah, man, I would love to be there, you know, side by side with Hawk, like throwing down, like that'd be awesome, together. But here's what I begin to notice when I look around our world. There's a lot of folks that fly solo. There's a lot of us that don't truly believe that we're better together because we have we, we don't have people in our lives to help make us better, to stand back to back. Bottom line is, if we were to be attacked, there's nobody to have our back. There's strength in numbers. There's strength in numbers. Like, I don't care how strong or gifted or wealthy you are. You need people in your life that are different than you. You need people in your life to complement and to complete you. You need people to have your back. I mean, think about this. In the movie, The Ego of Tony Stark needed the morality of Captain America. Hulk needed Scarlet to balance him out. I mean, like, we need people in our lives to balance us. We're better together. Now, if you've still got your finger there in Romans chapter 12, go, go there with me. The writer of Romans begins to explain this and gives us an illustration that all of us would understand. He says it this way. He says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Here's what he's saying. He's saying you're not as big of a deal as you think you are. You're not as big and bad as you think you are. Now, anybody ever known somebody that just thought they were all that in a bag of chips? Yeah, right? Are they sitting next to you right now? Don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Right? We've all known that person that they just thought they were God's gift to the world. They were all of that. Well, the writer here says, listen, don't don't think too highly of yourself. You're not as big and as bad as you think you are. I mean, you ain't all that is what he's saying. Look at your neighbor right now. Just say, you ain't all that. Tell him, you ain't all that. Turn to your, the neighbor on your other side, your second choice. Like, I didn't know you, but you ain't all that. We need to be reminded. And so right here in Romans chapter 12, we're told, don't think too highly of yourself. Because when we begin to think high of ourselves, we begin to isolate ourselves and we begin to remove other people from our lives. And that's not how we're supposed to live this life. Look at how this passage goes on in verse 4. It says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. Saying that we're, we're all one body. So he's like, let me explain to you how this works. There is one body, but there's a bunch of different parts. I mean, we would agree, right? There's, I mean, you got eyeballs, and you got nose and mouth, and, and you got teeth, and you got knees, and you got toes. And, and it's, it's easy for us at times to, to, to want to be something else. We look at somebody else's giftings and someone else's blessings and someone else's strengths, and we think, why can't I have their strengths? And it's easy for us to feel like maybe we're not as significant because, well, you know, I wish I could be an eye. I mean, could you imagine, like, the eye sees where you're going, or I wish I could be a bicep, you know, a bicep that just flexes and looks real big. Like, I wish I, should, wish I could be that, but I'm a, I'm a pinky toe, for crying out loud. Right? Somebody got to be a pinky toe. And here's the thing. We feel like because we're a pinky toe, we're not that big of a deal. And we're like, oh, what was me? I wish I could be something else. And, 
here's the deal. Like, that pinky toe doesn't seem like a big deal until you stub it on something. Am I right? <laughs> Middle of the night, corner of the dresser, whoo, that pinky toe will let you know it's a big deal. But here's the problem is oftentimes a lot of the, we, we look at other people's gifts and abilities and we think, man, does anybody even know that I exist? Does, do I even matter? And I would say, yeah, you matter. You are a part of something so much bigger and something so much better. You're part of the body. And because you're part of the body, you matter. And I oftentimes think of this, like the Avengers for a minute. I mean, could you imagine being a part of a team? Like, you know, you, you, like, like Iron Man is on your team for crying out loud. And what's happening here in Romans is we're told that we're different. And it's a good thing that we're different because we complement. We need each other. We're better together. Let's go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 6. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Now, did you know, has anyone ever stopped to tell you that you are gifted? Like, God has given you gifts that are unique to you. I mean, no one has your fingerprints. No one has your giftings. One of the things we try to do here at LifePoint is help people understand how they're gifted. That when God created you, he had a purpose, he had an intent, he had a skill set, and he gave it uniquely to you. And as long as you long to be someone else, you'll never discover who God created you to be. So one of the things we do is called growth track around here. If you've never been through growth track, you need to. Matter of fact, you could stick around today, one o'clock, we'll feed you lunch, it's free, and you can begin the growth track process. And what's so cool is during growth track, we help people figure out how God has wired them. We'll give you leadership assessment and, and spiritual gifts assessments. And here's what's so cool is people have light bulb moments. You know, you're sitting there with your spouse and they're like, well, I don't know. Here's the results of the test that I just took. And your spouse is like, oh my goodness, that is so you. That makes sense now. I see why you do what you do. And we begin to discover how we're wired and the people in our lives, how they're wired. And so I would just encourage you, if you don't know how you're gifted, you need to go through this. I'm convinced that about 80% of people that would call themselves Christians have no idea how and why God has gifted them the way that they're gifted. And so we want to help you figure that out so that life will begin to make sense. But we're told we have different gifts. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. God's given us those gifts. And then it goes on and says this. It says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The bottom line is you have been gifted a unique way to use your gifts so that your gifts come alongside of my gifts, come alongside of their gifts, and we all come together to form one body to accomplish what God has called us to do. So don't ever stop and think for a moment that you don't matter and your gifts don't matter because maybe you aren't gifted like somebody else. Your gifts matter. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10 says this. It goes on, says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And if you got your Bibles open, verse 10, I'm gonna give you a few things just to underline or to circle or to write in your notes. It goes on and says, be devoted to, say these next two words with me, be devoted to one another. And then it goes on and it says, honor one another above yourselves. It says, listen, we need to be committed. We need to be devoted to this one another. That we need to have room for people in our life because we're better together. We need one another. Now, interestingly enough, this, where we get these two words, one another, it was actually one word in the Greek, and it is the word alelon. Alelon. Look at it on the screen. Alelon. On three, let's all say alelon. Ready? One. Two, three, all alone. Now, interesting, it's interesting to me. When I look at this, it looks like all alone, but it means one another. So when you start looking at this, this word all alone shows up over and over and over in the New Testament, and we're told that we are to do life together with one another. As a matter of fact, it is used 59 times in the New Testament. 59 times. We just saw two of them. Be devoted to one another. That's commitment. That we're to honor one another as above ourselves. Then if you read down to verse 16, you'll find another one that says, live in harmony with one another, all alone, one another. Then if you just start reading through the New Testament, you'll find one another, one another, one another. Let me just show a few of them to you. We're told to love one another, to accept one another, serve one another, carry one another's burdens, encourage one another daily, greet one another with a holy kiss. How about that one, huh? So how about you turn to your neighbor right now, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you were like, hey, whoa. Some of you were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember Banaka. Remember that? 
Like, that's why we have mints here at church, just trying to help people out, <laughs> help you out. One another, one another. Here's what I want you to write down. Here's my tongue twister for the day. Write this down on your gray note card. Listen, you can't one another another if there are no others. Let me say it again. You can't one another another if there are no others. If there's no others in your life, you cannot one another another. We need people. We need to have room in our life and our schedule for other people, people that are different than us. I mean, think about this for a minute. There are aspects of following Jesus that are physically impossible if you don't have others in your life. These 59 one another's are commands of God that we cannot do if we don't have others in our life. Like, I don't care how much you pray, how much you read your Bible, how much you come to church, if you don't have time, if there's no room and there are no others in your life. If we don't have any others, we're missing the point. You see, what we do here, like, this is great, and this is exciting, but even better than this are the relationships that come out of this are the people that we're able to sit down with and get to know. Just want to ask, do you have any others? Are there people in your life that know the real you? Like they know you when you're having a bad day, not the Facebook you, because I'm convinced if the Facebook us, like the Facebook me met the real me, they wouldn't recognize each other. I mean, because we all put our best foot forward on Facebook or Instagram, right? Nobody's as good as their Instagram. Nobody's as good as their profile pic, because come on, that selfie, we took 12 of them. And then we put the filter just right. Like, like this is me oh I just woke up whatever you didn't just wake up you worked on that picture you changed the color and you fixed things and you got rid of pimples and we put our best foot forward and we do that when we come to church we won't be able to think we got all together who knows you when you're wearing sweatpants and eating ice cream out of the tub and I'm not just talking to the ladies here all right who knows the real you who knows you when the bottom falls out who knows you better than anybody else who knows the real you? Because it's easy for us to be surrounded by people but have folks that don't really know us. It's easy to say, well, I have goodness, thousands of, of friends online. But how many friends have you got in your life? My point is, who is it that knows the real you, your family life? Who is it that knows the condition of your marriage and how well you're parenting your kids? Who is it that knows the real you? Who knows the struggles you're dealing with this semester in school? Like, who really knows the real you. And a lot of us feel like, man, there was a day I had people like that, but life got busy and, and overtime and, and I had to, and, and I'll get back to that someday. And I want to tell you, there's no time like the present to create space in our life for people that know us. We're created to do life together, together. And one of the primary goals of Life Point Church is to create opportunities to invite others into our life because we need this. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You are going to become better because of the others that are in your life. Who are the others? Who are the people that you've got? So one of our desires here as a church is to help people connect in relationships. If you had to make a decision, like I can either come to church on Sunday, gather, listen to me preach, sing a few songs, or I can go and be a part of a small group where we get to know one another and we share meals together. If I had to choose between those two things as the pastor, I would rather you be connected with a small group. I would rather you be able to get around people that know you because the bottom line is you can come in here, you can grab a cup of coffee, sing some songs, listen to a message, and leave, and nobody knows you. This should be a supplement to what God is doing in our life. So if you had to pick, do I get in a group or do I go to church? I would say, as your pastor, get in a group. Get in a group where people can know you and challenge you. And the reason this is such a big deal is because we're getting ready to kick off a semester of groups. And I think there's no better opportunity than today, right now, to say, you know what? I'm going to create space in my life. I know I got a busy schedule, and I got to shuttle kids here, there, and everywhere. But if I could get one hour or two hours for myself to just simply have people in my life, to be able to get to know each other, and I know that's awkward. I know it's awkward for us to just kind of open up our hearts and our lives and to be able to create opportunities for people to know us and for us to know other people, but I think it's a risk worth taking take that next step saying I want to be a part of what God is doing I want to I want to be a part of this church and this family because we're better together together would you pray with me